one. Hello, everyone. Man, in this video, I'm fortunate enough to chat with one of my favourite actors, and in my opinion, one of the greatest actors in Ireland right now, the fantastic Graham Early. I mean, you, you may recognise him from projects such as Broken Law, directed by friend of his channel, Paddy Slarty. Uh, he's also been in things like Cardboard Gangsters, uh, Monged. But we are here today to discuss his newest film, The Black Guelph, directed by John Connors, another friend of the channel. Uh, but Graham, thank you so much for taking the time to come on. How are you doing today, man? Cheers, Daniel. Oh, man, I'm happy to be here. Thanks a lot for having me on, man. I, I like the work you're doing on the page here. Oh, uh, dude, dude, thank you for conquering Zoom. I mean, I know we had some trouble with Zoom, but we got it in the bag, you know, man? Oh, so I you're, make, you're making out now on fucking illiterate computers. <laughs> it's just because this Mac is new, so I didn't, yeah, and we, we worked it out in the end. It's grand. <laughs> yeah, he was up there. Yeah. He, was, he was like, so what's a Zoom? Can we not do this over, you know, Bebo yeah. or, I don't know, you were talking about Bebo and all this Yeah, stuff. I was, yeah, it wasn't me, oh, yeah. No, <laughs> I, I downloaded about six different apps and stuff for this, but look, we got it in the end. We're here now, I love it. Oh. That's the important thing. But, dude, I mean, I nailed the Black Wealth. I mean, how many times do you get people coming up to you saying, how would you pronounce that? Exactly. How, how long were you practicing that for? I'd say oh, you were in your head oh, Donnie, I was afraid John, John Connors would batter me if I got it wrong. So I was in my bathroom mirror all day. I say, say Black Wealth, Black Wealth, Black yeah, Wealth. Yeah. I don't correct people. People come up to me, the Black Gelope, the Black Gelope. <laughs> the Black Gelope. The Black Gelope. As long as they watch it, yeah. Um, so tell me how did the black whale come to you because i know you work you've worked with john on it like cardboard gangsters monks and broken law you've worked with john before how, did he come to you with this project yeah no um i work with john a lot more than that those are the big ones you mentioned there and um, we've done loads of short films together and other things over the years but uh how did this one come this was during during um the wonderful two years we had there with the fucking plague that spread across oh, yeah. the world and we were all shut at home john originally contacted me out of the blue to do a piece uh, called dear ireland's which was like a monologue at the, the Abbey Theatre. We're doing an online thing, monologues now. And he wrote this beautiful little piece right now. It's available on YouTube to watch. And I did that with John. I collaborated with him on that. And while we were talking about that, he kept going on about this character he had in mind called, um, well, it had a different name at the time. Now went on to become Canto, which is the yeah. role of the Black Wealth. And he was just talking about the kind of, the savage nature of this character mixed, mixed with the insecurities and the vulnerability and all that. And it was just really interesting. We were going back and forth for a while. And he told me, I actually have a script for this. So he, he ended up sending me um, an early draft of it. it. Had a different name all the time during Yeah, that bless you, father, right? Bless you, father. father. Yeah, that was that was going way back. So I went through loads of drafts. Again, I, I was mainly focused on the character. And then I saw this beautiful, tragic story with all these different characters and all interconnected. And that, and that that was where it came from. And after that, it was just a year or two of just developing like um, nonstop. You know what I mean? So yeah, I mean, not too bad. He was telling me you got he filmed it. Was this during like the the fucking the height of COVID? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was one of those periods where it dipped down for a little while and then it went back up to level five and it was out of control. And I think us and only one other production were the only ones filming around town at the time. Mm. Like it was town was like a ghost town and every problem you can think of popped up. While <laughs> oh, like making independent films, man, is, is a nightmare enough. And I've done a lot of yeah. at this stage. But doing it at this stage, like I don't think I'll ever come across working on another film again with so many problems. But the whole way through, people were losing their minds. And John probably told you about it, like, it was madness. But yeah. we, we knew we were making, me and John and Tiernan and a few others, we knew we were making something great. So it was like, like, how do you make the most of it? It's like, how, how fucking raw and how hard it is. That's going to make it better. That's going to make yeah, it Yeah, he was saying that. He was saying he was yeah. manipulating people, saying, you think this is rough, lads. Think about what yeah. they had to go through. So yeah, it's not... <laughs> I was saying that man, the guy was I was like just losing my mind, the production having a good time with it, going, this is great because whatever, whatever way I'm feeling about it, it's gonna come across on camera. And I mean, yeah. you hear stories about other films like legendary films being made in really harsh circumstances oh, and apocalypse now. Boom. Yeah, straight away. Francis yeah. Ford Coppola almost killed himself twice with it. Yeah. Marlon Brando showed up without knowing any of his lines. Yeah, Dennis Hopper losing his mind running around <laughs> like a baboon on set, man. Uh, he was he was a cocaine fiend though back in the day. So I think yeah, that was yeah. it. That's where they had him on set. He was just in a about... he just rolled with it. He just rolled with him, man. Yeah. But a uh, great documentary too, Heart of Darkness. But um, yeah, that there you go. So we were we were embracing it for what it is in that regard, but it was still it was very hard now. But I think the result we got in the end was beautiful, though. I, I think I'm very proud of the film. John said for the next project, he'll let me do the BTS so I can do my own Heart of Darkness so we can witness you all losing your mind on camera. I said it to John. Some way through the production, I turned to him and I just went, mate, it is a fucking crime. We don't have somebody here doing a documentary about this. And he was like, I know. But like, there was enough to juggle without trying to juggle in yeah. someone recording it as well. And but imagine I, someone... 
someone filming while you're freaking out, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah that's what I mean. It would have been dangerous, man, you know? So um, that's a shame, you know, that's a shame. Maybe you could do a documentary interviewing us now about it, but yeah, I mean, there would have been some crazy footage in that, man. You know? And you, you it, it'll all just be like smoking cigars, not even talking about... John was telling me he had like, he had four cigars in each hand, he was just puffing them away on the set. Yeah, what? yeah, yeah, yeah. John was just running around trying to not lose his mind, like just hyperventilating most of the time, you know what I mean? But I mean, it, it must have been cold. No, we're not, it was it was freezing. It was absolute. That was one of the things that stuck. It It was absolutely Baltic. It was one of those snow warning storm times, you know. And it's like on the tip oh, of snowfall. Yeah. And, and um, but like, but John was great though in regard. Like with all that madness going on, the important stuff as an actor is just the director giving you those little moments of communication when you need them. And I mean, fuck all the other bullshit that's going on, all that. But like John, he's an actor first and foremost. Yeah. And he, he co-wrote this with Tyrion, so this lived inside his head for a while. And then putting that into being a director, I mean, he was giving us beautiful little, little just little moments of don't worry about everything that's going on, just focus on this. And I think it comes across in the in the performances in the film, all across the film, you know. So yeah, and so I mean, we see on the Instagram, we've seen with the teasers and stuff that it's you know it's teased kind of as a gangster film, but we do know obviously it's about clerical abuses in the church, which is something that's an incredibly heavy topic to kind of leap into. How do you wake up as an actor and say, right, well, today I have to shoot a scene dealing with something as heavy as that? How, how does that, what do you have to do mentally? Can you jump into that or is there a process or? Yeah, well, I, I, I love my own prep that I do the weeks leading up to a film. So I spend a lot of time with the script on my own, sitting in cafes or sitting in libraries uh, more often. And, uh, you know, libraries are great. People don't take advantage of them. It's a quiet study space. And like, cause sometimes you need to get away from your own house and all that to go work on it. So I literally, every scene, I put them down as blocks and I attack each block for like a few days on its own. This is long before I even get on set. And I just go through every scenario in my head about what I, what I suspect will be the case on the day on set when we're on, what location I imagine it might be. And kind of based on my own past experience in other films, how will it be kind of getting into the headspace on this day where I am kind of so... Long story short, I do a lot of that stuff leading up to it. So when I walk on set, I, I kind of know what I need to be doing. I mean, there's a lot of stuff I can't even really explain in words. It's just kind of mental gymnastics you do. Yeah. You start geared up for the emotional stuff. But just find little hooks that you relate to. If there's something happening with the character that you've never experienced in your life, you can probably find something if you move down a few levels in terms of like risk factor, like something similar in your own life. And then you just raise the stakes in your heads right before the scene. And a lot of it as well is with the other actor you're working with. I mean, if you're working with quality actors, like every actor in this film, the cast is fucking phenomenal. Yeah. And all you have to do is look in their eyes and listen to what they're saying and just really, you know, take your time with it and all that. And then just hopefully it comes to you. Sometimes it's tricky, but sometimes it's really fluid. In this film, it was all really fluid, you know? So, I mean, you wouldn't describe this as one of your tougher films, would you? Or is that is that fair enough to say? Well, what do you mean by tough or like a tough film or tough? I mean, yeah, because like you're putting yourself, I mean, it's something like cler clerical abuses. Like that's something to me. It's like when you're making it okay. like broken law, that's one thing because, you know, it's about two brothers. And that's really that's I mean, and I thought broken law was a really beautiful story. And I know we're both mates with Paddy Slarty. He was fantastic. But something oh, about Paddy, this. Well, man. Shout out to Paddy. Yeah, legend. Yeah, Paddy. Yeah. Well, you, you can't tell him how good he is. This is the cycle. We can't let them know they're good, but we can acknowledge ah, fuck that. that. I tell them all they're good because there's very few good ones out there, mate. So I tell them when they're good. You know what I mean? There you go. And it doesn't. Yeah. And it's not bad when he thinks about you for the next script and all that. So, so it all, yeah, it all yeah, works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's cooking. He's writing away. Paddy actually told me a great. I'm not going to say anything about it. He told me a great idea before, and I hope he goes back and, and writes it. Because yeah, he's a great director. We he, he were talking and he was talking about his next project and he said he thinks it's even better than Broken Law. Yeah, I, I'm not too sure what he's working on right now. He's got loads going on, but he told me a little idea for a concept like going back to Broken Law and it was a beautiful little idea. But again, I'm not going to say anything about it, but he's one of those people that, like John, I just would continuously work with him if I could. Yeah. You know? But going back to what you're saying, I think, what, so what you mean basically is was it a tough role for me as an actor doing it in yeah. terms of headspace and all that? Yes, because... Uh, along with all the stuff I said about how difficult it was to get it made, the level five stuff, the places that I had to go as Canto and so much in the script, when people see it, they'll know what I mean. Like, there's no kind of throwaway scenes in this film. It's all really heavy, particularly yeah. for the character's journey. So there were times during this, this, uh, this film that, because uh, we got shut down for a while, so I spent a good few weeks in the headspace for this because we got shut down, like a week, I think a week or two into it, maybe a week or, or a week and a half, we got shut down for like level five reasons. Mm -hmm. And then a few weeks of no filming and then we went back to it. But I stayed in town in the accommodation that they had me in. I was like, I just want to stay in the headspace, I want to stay in this area. So 
weeks and weeks and weeks, I was kind of just walking around like a nutcase, kind of just being can't with my day to day life. Yeah. Because you have that freedom in that, in that situation because you can just be going in and out with shops and all and interacting with people as the character. But I remember at one point I was ringing John one day and I was like, man, I, I honestly think my fucking head is a bit fucked up doing this film. And he gave yeah. me a great when he was like, yeah, you're, like your body doesn't know it's all lies. Your body doesn't know what you're doing is lying. Your mind kind of does, but you're tricking yourself into all this vulnerability and trauma and you know taking a bit of abuse and stuff and then it's like you expect that you're going to feel normal so yeah man it was a roller coaster to go on for me how'd man. you let go of that how'd you let go of that when you're done i don't know man i don't know if you do i think it kind of like not to sound dramatic but like i think little things like that on different films you do they kind of just become a little bit of a part of you and it kind of just you kind of learn from it and you, you shake off certain things because once you get back on with your own normal life you get distracted with your own shit and hopefully if you're busy working you're moving on to another role but yeah. um, no, that one was with me for a while, man. After like, it's, it, it's yeah. funny because I hadn't actually even thought about that. But since you asked it, it was it was one that stuck me for a while afterwards. Yeah, See, like compared, a- to, compared to Broken Law, because you just said there, like Patty knew when we were making Broken Law. Broken Law was a little bit more, I suppose you call it more of a digestible kind of film. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. More, um, for the, for the kind of not the whole family, not for kids, but like it's more broader. You know, this is very very gritty. This new one. Like, as you said, there's a lot of elements of crime and all that, but it's abuse, it's crime, it's a real kitchen sink, dark drama. Like, we, we talked about films that me and John love a lot, like Nil by Mill and Tyrannosaurus, uh, starring Peter Mullen, like, fantastic film. That's one of my favorite British performances. And, like, then French uh, kind of cinema dark, like, Bullhead and Rust and Bone. Like, we were going for that real dark tone, kind of stylistic as well. So, hopefully, we got somewhere close to those other fucking legendary films, you know? Yeah, man, I was talking to John about that yesterday. And just, even the way he kind of, the, he, the project is color graded with the moody oranges and there's kind of a, a, a blackness from what we've seen from yeah. the teaser. Man, yeah. it's great stuff all around. But so when you're, when you're doing a project like this, I mean, it's fair to say that this does differ from your previous project. So was this kind of a leap in, because in, I mean, you talk about as an actor kind of putting yourself in that rocking around town being can It reminds me of a story of Daniel Day-Lewis when you, I don't know if you've seen There Will Be Blood by Paul Thomas Anderson. Oh, one of my favourite films, mate. One of my favourite films. I only yeah. bought it on Blu-ray there recently. Yeah, Blu-ray. Oh my, yeah, Blu-ray. What are you saying? What's a Blu-ray? What's a Blu-ray? Greg? I, I, I now, now you see, you're, you're too young for this, man. But like, I am from the the age of we bought hard copies, everything, DVDs and CDs. But all that's kind of more or less died out, and it sort of breaks me heart because there is a beauty to the hard copies. But Blu-rays, at the very least, you get all the extra features with them, all the like behind the scenes, and I love all that shit. So oh, if, yeah. I see, if I see classics that I like on Blu-ray, I'm like, yeah, why not? And support the industry and grab one of them, you know. Yeah, uh, did PTA do a director's commentary for There Will Be Blood? Because oh, wouldn't you just love to listen to that? I don't think there's a director's commentary on that one. No, not on the copy I have. Anyway, but yeah, that would be amazing. Man. I don't I think he's there. arsed to sit there for two hours and like look at one of his because every director I talk to, like, I never want to watch it again. And like, you yeah. know, it's like Francis Ford Coppola was watching The Godfather and he was doing a commentary track and he was literally ripping into it saying, oh, that shot's not good enough. I could have done this. And it's like, if that fella can't watch The Godfather, the rest of us don't have any hope for enjoying that. <laughs> You would, uh, you would when you're watching these films, I suppose, a lot, like, notice more than anything, the things you don't like about it, you know, as yeah. a filmmaker, particularly directors, especially the writer directors as well, because they really would be so insecure about things that didn't end up the way they saw it in their minds, whereas they're missing all the absolutely amazing stuff that you and me are watching, oh, that's fucking brilliant and all that, but, yeah. like, I do understand what they're coming at. Yeah, I think when you're doing a comment, I haven't done before, I'd love to do one on a, on a film I did, you have to kind of take it with a pinch of salt and have a bit of fun with it, I suppose. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll just be moaning about the whole thing the whole time you're watching, you know. I, I know who wants to hear that. Man, I love those comedies. I bought the original uh, It the Clown, you know, like the, the old TV film from back yeah. in the 90s. I because I think that's a great film. I much prefer that to the new one. And uh, they, there's a commentary on that, and all the lads are just having the crack on the beat. Yeah. Just talking about what a great experience it was to make the film and how it was a different time of filmmaking and all that stuff. So I love all that. I've actually watched that with the commentary far more times than I watched the film on its own. Yeah. You know, it's it's good stuff. Oh man, that, that's amazing. But that's what I love about DVDs because like, there's a collection of DVDs in that shelf over there and I always flip through them. So there's a director's commentary in the back. I'll pop it in. Because I mean, when I was talking to Paddy, Paddy told me that was a lot of how he got his start. It was just listening to director commentary. Yeah. And that's something that, that's really fascinating to me. But for, we were talking about Daniel day I don't know. We, we, got, we got off track with Todd Matter. Yeah, we keep going off track. So that's my bad. Yeah, my thoughts go this way and that way. But uh, no, I'm saying? happy to go. Like, this, this is what I love. Like, I, I, the, any day I get to t- chat about There Will Be Blood is a good day. But no, we were talking about Daniel Day Lewis and he was in Wicklow cutting down trees. Yes. Because 
he was cutting down trees for like four months before filming. So how much prep do you have to do as an actor? And also after that, uh, uh, I'm also wondering, we talked about directors watching their own work. As an actor, what's it like for you? Is it once at the premiere and never again? If Broken Law was on RTE, would you watch it? Uh, well, to answer that question, um, I wouldn't be overly... Uh, I know some actors, like, I can never watch anything I'm in. And I understand where they're coming from because I do feel that element of watching myself. But I'm such a film fan that I have, I have a way of, when I'm watching things I'm in, I can almost detach the fact that it's me from it. And not really even focus on my performance or even my character that much and kind of just appreciate other stuff in it. So I am able to watch most things that I've done. Now, look, the stuff I've done back in the day when I was coming up as an actor, I, you know, it wasn't great stuff overall, like short films and all that. I'm like, I just wouldn't be arse watching them again, you know. But but, I, but then sometimes as well, actually, technically, you are interested in seeing that stuff, kind of how how the business has developed, how the independent scene has developed over the years. But yeah, I would, it'd be, I'd be kind of middle ground with a man. I wouldn't be over the moon about continuously watching myself. But if it's a good film, I can appreciate so many other aspects. And especially if you're watching it with an audience, you really feed off the energy of them watching it. Yeah. And you're not even watching the film, you're just enjoying them, what their experience, what moments are they going to react to and th this and that, you know? So that's good as well, like the premieres and screens of films and that, you know? Yeah. Um, and what were we saying, a prep beforehand? Yeah, beforehand, <laughs> like, it's all down to how much time you have. I can get a call sometimes and be told uh, literally the day after tomorrow, would you ready to go on something? And you can't turn it down, but that's yeah. not ideal. It's not ideal. So all you have to do is just get your lines down and just do as much on the fly as you can. But like, yeah. like Black Wealth, I had like a number of weeks leading up to that where I just was doing nonstop prep. I mean, there was even a bit of a physical transformation as well. John wanted me to put on a bit of weight for it as well, be a bit heavier as a character, you know? So I did was doing that as well. So that was full on for the weeks leading up to that and just thinking about every different aspect of it, you know? So it's all down to how much of a luxury you have. Like Day Lewis, whenever he was doing that film, Cutting Down Trees, he might have had the luxury of having a lot of free time before it. And he doesn't have to probably go work a job at nine to five. So he just can totally submerge himself. And so if you have that freedom, and that's great. You know what I mean? So I'll take that if I can get it, when I can get it. Oh man, 100%. And something I, I love about the Black Wells, from what we've seen from the teasers, and I was talking about this with John Connors yesterday, and we were just talking about how much we love winners in cinemas. Mm -hmm. Just that one single shot where you can, and my, my favorite example of this is in a film, I don't know if you've seen it, by Martin McDonough, it's called Three Billboards Outside of Ebbing, Missouri. Love it, uh, yeah. Halfway through this character, you know, he loses his friend, played by Sam Rockwell, uh, character's name is Dixon. Mm -hmm. And he loses his friend, and he's so angry, he pulls a baton out of his pocket. Great scene. Yeah, you know the scene I'm on about, and yeah. he, he walks across the road, and there's this guy earlier in the film who's giving them hassle, and Sam Rockwell's friend has just died, so he pulls the baton out, he walks across the road, he stops cars, he walks up the stairs, and this is all in a wonder, he comes around, and he just beats him in the face, he throws him out the window, and he comes down, he walks over to him, he says, he says you see, it's not just the blacks I beat, and then he keeps walking, and it's just a crazy scene, and there's a great wonder for the teaser of the Black Wealth, I mean, what, what was it like shooting that, because that's just so fascinating to me, did that take many takes trying to get that wonder going, or what? Do you mean, me, the doorway? Yeah, the doorway, because yeah, that, yeah. yeah. I think we got that on one take, man, to be honest, yeah, I don't Actually, think we, yeah, I don't think we did any more takes for that, because um, me and uh, uh, Lauren Larkin, who plays uh, me, me ex girlfriend, that who does a fucking phenomenal job. This is one of those cases. What I was telling you about about how good you can be if you're working with a, another good actor, and how it doesn't yeah. take that much. Like we went in, we didn't even really talk about the dialogue before that. There was a blueprint script. When I got to that doorway, I think I said to her before, and are you cool with it? She was like, "Grand, we'll do whatever. We'll just stay loose with it." And we just started going back and forth, and half of that dialogue is in the script, half of it's improvised. Yeah. Boom, 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 boom. Hit every note, and then it was done. And I think John was like, "I'm happy with that. We want to move on." So it was, it was that simple, man. But like, there's a lot. There's, I won't say too much. But when you watch Black Well, there's other takes in the film that you're gonna love. That, said, I mean, that he, are more difficult to do in that Warner style. But yeah. John loves the Warners. He does, and he's got there's one in particular I'm thinking of. It's fucking incredible, and you're gonna love him. Like, um, and it's um, a bit more um actiony in like the one you were talking about there. You know, there's more that can be a bit more technically difficult because if you make one mistake with yeah. an act, it can ruin the whole thing. You know, but uh, yeah, no man, there's some shots in this film now that you're gonna think are fucking amazing. But that one, yeah, I think we got it in one take, as far as I remember, unless I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure we did, yeah. Oh man, fair play. So do you have to stay in Canto all day while you're shooting? Is there a break, you know, between scenes or what's that? Or do you, is it the mindset? 
Yeah, it's not. It's not like uh, there's that old thing people slag off actors about. Oh, the, the method acting where they have to be staying and can't do exactly that. It's not that, and I've never had to do that. You just kind of keep a kind of tempo in your head. Like if there's a day where I have to be like really fucking upset and angry, I'm still going to be because on a film set you have to be interacting with the crew because there's lots of technical job aside from just being pleasant. Like yeah. it's not about being pleasant, but like there's there's technical things you just have to discuss all day long. You know, from dealing with the mics to the lighting department, stuff like that. Way, so you can't be kind of like you, you know, just in a bubble all on your own. But you might know, it's, oh, Graham seems like he's in a bit of a bad mood today, and it's like he's not in a bad mood, but he's doing a scene in a few minutes where it, like he has to be like really angry and all that. So yeah. it's that kind of common sense of just like most people on film sets get this. You don't even have to say it to them; they just know the actor's got something coming up. They, they know where his head's at. And if I'm doing a scene where I'm supposed to be in a pub having a great time, you might see me having to crack with everyone on set before because you're gearing yourself up. So it is just, it's kind of just keeping that loose tempo, I find, you know what I mean? But I don't, it doesn't have to be like, most of the time it doesn't have to be at like the extreme in character all the time. Because as I said, a lot of the time when I'm offset, it's maybe it's because I'm a weirdo. I just, I like kind of walking around sort of being like the character, you know? It doesn't yeah. harm anyone, just do anything. Like you can just have interactions and stuff on the street, little things like, does he hold the door up with someone? Does he not hold the door up with someone? You know what I mean? How does he talk to the girl at the till when he's buying something kind of thing? Yeah. And like, you know, that kind of can keep my head in character more than that. You know what I mean? Man, Cause you look, you look like completely transformed in the teaser and I can't wait to see, I mean, I think you, you just looked, I don't know what it was, but there was such an intimidating, I think presence to you. So I can't, I can't wait to see what you Yeah, do well, he's got, he's got a lot of uh, facets going on. Like me and John talked about, like that's the thing with that character. We didn't want to put something up on screen that's already been seen before. Too too tough one way, or maybe too vulnerable one way. He's a good old mix of different things, and he's he's been through a fucking lot. And there's a lot of mystery to that character as well. When you see it, you'll know what I mean. There's, there's unanswered questions in there as well. But that's all stuff that me and John either talked about in private, or I just worked out my head in private, you know what I mean? So hopefully, I, I appreciate that you're feeling that from what you've seen so far, you know what I mean? Because th there was a lot of talk put into that. I mean, surely the character must have changed since initial conception. Since, I mean, on the, on, like it's one thing on the page, but when you're on there on the day and then obviously you're bringing something to it, did, did the character change much? I mean, obviously the trauma is a lot the same, but do you think that the character changed since, you know, written on the page to the screen? Massively, massively. Yeah. yeah. And was a lot of it just on set decisions or what was that process? I, I, I can't even uh, take full full credit to say that it was like all preemptive and like designed to be that way. You have the character on the page the way John envisioned it and Tiernan, Tiernan Williams wrote it and kind of then my interpretation of reading it. Then I get to set and when you're trying to just with being on set and being with the other actors, it just automatically becomes something slightly different. But there was one time on set where I, I pulled John aside because we've been discussing real people in real life that we wanted certain traits from. And I asked him, do you want me to go more in the direction of being like this real guy who I was naming by name? And he actually said to me, he was like, no, Graham, I want you to be like, keep, keep, keep on the patch you're on and even bring more of like a certain aspect of yourself that you're bringing to it there. And I kind of, initially, as an actor, you do that, you kind of go, oh, but hold on. Is the idea that I had of this kind of make-believe character not better? And like, they'll say to you, no, trust me. Yeah. Aspects of what you're doing kind of instinctively are better. So it, it definitely, be he became a lot more, um, he became a lot more vulnerable as a character as the production was going on, I felt. Like, um, yeah. You know, le less elements. I mean, there's definitely still very dark, psychotic elements in Canto, but less psycho y than what we saw on paper originally. Yeah. It came, and that's just, I suppose, it's become more human, you know, like just you're feeling that as you're doing it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like even in Broken Law, like you rob a bank and I'm sitting there, I hope he doesn't get caught. I hope he gets yeah, away. You know? yeah. I mean, there, there's something really fascinating about, you know, vulnerableness you think I bring, you brought up. And I think a lot of that's probably working with John because there's such a trust between you and John. Yeah. You know, there is that ability. Like if you were working with a director you've never worked before, maybe there'd be a bit of hesitancy there. Mm -hmm. Would you Would you say that'd be fair? Um, I don't know. I'm pretty loose with it personally. You know, like I, I, have, I have my strong ideas going into everything I do. And then the moment I'm on set, I'm, I'm more or less happy. If I feel the director's confident in what they want and they're not, I've, I've never met a director that I could, I've been lucky with the other directors I've worked with, even on the independent shorts and music videos and all that. I've usually always worked with people I thought had a good head on their shoulders. And yeah. I'm, I'm usually fairly confident, especially if it's a writer director who kind of like this all came from their mind. I've never gotten to a set and like had a complete difference of opinions. Yeah, you might have different opinions and certain ideas in scenes within yeah. this, you know, but the actual kind of personality of the character and all that, it's usually 
kind of been what I've expected to be when I get there. And if they want me to go more vulnerable, I, I personally have a problem with that. The, the trust factor comes in when it comes to John and how much I trust him. It's more known that um, the whole production is going to be done properly. So nothing's going to be wasted. So I'm going to, like all that prep I was telling you about, it's not it's not a waste of time because I'm not going in with some fucking agent who's going to like, just, just they're just kind of winging it. I knew I was going into a very high level production with all the cast that they put in, with all the crew. I knew a lot of the crew from other productions. I'm like, yeah, he's the best, she's the best. Like, I mean, you know what I mean? So that's where the trust comes into it. In terms of the character, I'll go wherever. Wherever the director wants me to go, I'm happy to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? So as long as it makes sense to me, like as an actor, it just has to make sense to you. Why, why do you want me to be doing that? Like, as long as you can answer that question, it's fine. I, don't know. And I, think, I think it's about honesty because I'm reading a book by Sidney LeMay and he directed films like 12 Angry Men, you know, Murder on the Orient Express, uh, Dog Day Afternoon, loads of great films. And he talks a lot about how acting is honesty and he's worked yeah. with people like Marilyn Brando and stuff like that. And it, it, I suppose it is a bit easier to be honest when you're in a room full of people you do know, people you trust, because honesty yeah. is obviously such a huge factor of that. But another thing, I mean, I'd love to ask you this. Uh, it would be all right if I asked you a few more questions. You have some time? Oh, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I was fantastic. just going to say to you there, like sitting in the Met, like just before we get off him, um, like John, he loves rehearsal. John liked to do a bit of rehearsal before this film. And like Dog the Afternoon, I heard Pacino doing a great interview before talking about, they did weeks and weeks of rehearsing like that was a play beforehand. Now, I personally, I can work either way. I sometimes like going in completely raw, meeting new actors and just kind of seeing what happens. But it's a rare luxury. Like the newest one I'm doing with John here, we haven't even finished that Leopard Skin. I'm sure he told you about that. We're in the middle of filming that we got four weeks or three weeks maybe rehearsal time on that and mm-hmm. i've never done that in the film before but we had a bit of that with broken laws uh, sorry yeah uh, the black wealth where we met up out in john and tiernan's house in lakshini and uh we kind of were just uh workshopping scenes in the living room and all that so that's like the city the met style of acting there just basically going with a bit of prep you know beforehand mm-hmm. like it's a like it's a theater piece there's yeah there's such a consensus it's really split like I'm reading the Sidney LeMay book and he talks about doing films with like Paul Newman and the verdict and like he'll rent out a big like food hall like a big PE hall and he'll mm. just kind of be directing people all around it for two weeks yeah. or something like that and yeah. then there are other directors who are like talked to other directors who are like no I'll never do rehearsal for a project because they feel like it makes it static or something but there's obviously just there's two aspects to it and like there's no right or wrong answer it's just that's it's just really fascinating way to see how yeah i can i can see i can see both sides of the argument and i've worked more i've worked far more with the no rehearsal and i'm fine with it but i find a lot of actors worry about it they prefer to have rehearsal but when i'm going to a situation where we get rehearsal for me it's like a luxury it's like a kind of like wow this is really nice we we get to actually rehearse beforehand and as long as it's not a case of like rehearsal should be a loose process, like like it was for Leopard Skin, the one I'm I'm, I'm still in the middle of doing. We yeah. just more or less playing around with the scenes. I wouldn't see the point in rehearsal if you are really kind of getting everything exactly the way it has to be and then running it again and again before the camera's even on it, because that might lose a bit of spark as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. You know? But there's no harm in sitting around the table. Like I like doing table readings the odd time with actors. Just we have the scripts and we're just doing the dialogue and just doing a little bit of chatting and stuff like that. That that to me is a good kind of rehearsal way of doing it you know which we did there for as i said like i wasn't involved in the full three weeks now but i came in on numerous days with um uh, jason byrne and john and all the other guys on the most recent one there so oh dude that's amazing and like yeah rehearsal that that's something it, it's just such a fascinating argument because normally there's right or wrong but there is no right or wrong it's just how every director works and i'm sure you know yourself no yeah. two directors are the same every yeah. director kind of comes up with different shots or different angles or different decisions they'll make on the day you yeah, know maybe that's in mind as well sorry to cut up cut across there oh, bro, please go ahead as well i mean there's different there's just fantastic directors in the world that even have different styles about the way they want actors to approach the dialogue because if you take like coen brothers and tarantino they're well known for basically the, the script is bible and you say it exactly yeah. what it is and i understand that that's more like my days of theater going back in the day like you, the script is exactly the way it is and you work it like that boom 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 but like most of the irish films i've done broken law black wealth these were all improv mania these were all the script is just a blueprint and so yeah so some actors like that sound some actors like i personally i can jump in here one you know what i mean they both have benefits as far as i'm concerned you know yeah, and, and I see that in a lot of your work. I mean, in Cowboy Gangsters, Broken Law, and from what the teasers from the Blackwell, characters stutter, 
and they speak in kind of a conjunction, and that makes them more. And I, like I know, obviously, John made the decision to a lot of a handheld, which just that's that kind of Paul Greengrass house of storytelling where it makes it more. And then in, yeah. in Paul Greengrass's film, character stutter, and that's always more fascinating to me when characters you know speak like us and they clear their throat when they're talking because that makes it that makes it just even that bit more real. And I mean, when you're shooting in something as gritty as Dublin, and I'm not sitting here saying we're a third world country, but inner city Dublin's a pretty pretty gritty place. So when you can shoot something like that handheld, I feel like that almost you know brings it to a different level you know because if it was static shots and if you, if you painted inner city dublin to be really pretty it'd be like well where's the honesty in that where's the where's the artistic nature in that one yeah well, certainly and- not certainly not where these characters are spending their time i mean there yeah. is a there is a kind of more upper class version of dublin it does exist but it's not where those characters you just named those films where there's especially kind like whatever about joe in the black in, um, in broken law like joe i play joe to be like almost like a softy like he's meant to be like that he fancies himself as a little bit of a tough guy but that guy is way over his head he yeah. just basically takes the lead off people he's an impulse disorder that was the whole thing with him, with him. He, uh, in my mind going into it, is he has impulse disorders. He can't say no to things. I mean, yeah. he gets he roped into going and robbing the credit union. He didn't plan on doing that. He just literally woke up with a hangover, oh, in the fear. And <laughs> usually somebody would like say, would well, you want to go back in the points? Oh, you twisted my arm. Whereas he gets twisted into going and robbing the credit union. So yeah. that's, that's Joe. And I mean, like, the character in Mon was a bit like that as well. There want to be tough guys that are just kind of like in way over their head. Canto is a completely different animal. And again, I won't say too much because I don't want to ruin it for people, but he's far more the real thing in, in, in what he's capable of and what he's done, you know? But yeah. we're meeting him at a point in his life where it's all coming crumbling down around him. And for most of the characters in the film, it's like that, you know? We're meeting them all when it's all gotten a bit too much and it's fucking exploded. Yeah, yeah it captures the grittiest of the gritty parts of Dublin in this new one, man. It's- yeah, but that's honesty, you know, man. I mean, that's what I love about Cardboard Gangsters. Like, when I heard there was a film shot in Darndale, which is five minutes from my house, I couldn't believe it. I was like, no, films are shot in Los Angeles. There's not a film yeah, yeah. made in Darndale. And then I found out everyone was talking about Cardboard Gangsters. And there's a point halfway through that film where, you know, it's... There's a, there's a point of no return. I talk to many writers and they always talk about, you know, Sid Field, storytelling basics, the point of no return, the point where everything kind of changes. And, you know, you get to the point, I think some people watch it and go, oh, that's lethal. Halfway through the film, like he's on top of the world. But then, you you know, there's that voice in the back of your head saying, well, it, there's, there's no return out there. I can't conceive of a way that this ends happily. And yeah. so much of that is honesty. And like, it would have been a cop out if Cardboard Gangsters had an ending where it was a happy ending and I, it's it's not happy and it's 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 a real and it's kind of a bittersweet ending but honesty is something that i think is so evident in irish productions and it's something like the black wealth and i asked this to john how important is honesty for you as an actor yeah, well it's essential in terms of um like the character being honest like that's essential i have to in the scene unless i mean even if the character is a lawyer i have to be honest about the fact within the context of the scene that he's a lawyer but he's doing it for his reasons. If you're asking me as an actor to, to evoke some emotion that doesn't make sense to me in the context of the scene, I just can't do it. Like, I just can't work that way. I'm just like, well, what, explain to me what you want. What, like, what, what, why? You know, we're not robots. You know, there's a reason why we're doing things kind of thing. So like, that's essential. The film overall having an honest message behind it. If I'm not involved in the writing and directing, that's kind of out of my ballpark. I can't really control yeah. that. It's just my journey as an actor in terms of the character. I'm all about the character and everything I'm doing. Like I'm focusing on my story and all the interactions I'm having on, along the way. And uh, yeah, they have to, has to be uh, honest, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, to be honest, has to be honest, yeah. And when you're doing something in inner city Dublin, like, I mean, Cardboard Gangsters, I mean, you play a Northern Ireland lad, right? In, Nor- in Cardboard yeah, Gangsters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he was, if I remember correctly, He'd been living in Darndale for a good few years at that stage, but he'd been going back and forth. I think his mother was from, I gave him this whole backstory. His mother was from Darndale. His father was from up north. And he kind of lived up north till he was about 12, 13. Then he came back to Darndale. So he's been there since he's about 20 odd. Yeah, but he he got he, he wears that as a badge of honour because he knows that his accent gets him a little bit more feared, you know, being connected to the Rana, you know. That was yeah. great. That was a great experience I'm working on that. Oh, the, that you are you are fantastic. And that chainsaw that's scene was just, oh, it was just amazing, yeah, man. Yeah. I, that's you probably know the story about that, that he fucking did come at me with chainsaw, come through the door and all with it. No, and he didn't. Who? John Connors came in with chainsaw. John Connor, right, the, 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 the safety people or whatever were telling him to chainsaw and he was supposed to chase me onto the corridor I run in the door and that's the end of the scene and he didn't say that to me but I knew I says I guarantee you he's going to come through that door and put that chainsaw right up to me so I was ready for it and he fucking did it so I just rolled with it kind of. but that shot is him 
unpreparedly coming in with the chainsaw holding it to me. Like, you know? Oh, that must have been some serious stuff. That, that was honestly there. That was yeah. definitely honestly there. I could there. honestly say to myself, I could honestly see where the character would be fucking shit in his bags there. It was John Connors holding the chainsaw. Holding it. Um, so anyway, so it, you're telling me acting isn't all glory and just pure, you know, bliss and Hollywoodness. That That's his revelation. But when you if, if it's any of that shit, I, have, I don't know about it. Really. <laughs> not, not all red carpets. Uh, but Canto, no. Canto is a, a character from inner city Dublin. Is there more of a personalness to you? Because, I mean, you obviously, you, you, you're, um, you're from here in Dublin, right? No, I'm from Salvage. I'm from Salvage originally. Oh, right. Yeah. Like, which is kind of right beside Luke, and uh, so it's technically outside of Dublin. But I've kind of, I've kind of spent. I'm, I'm a bit of a mongrel. I've kind of spent all my life kind of in and out of town. All my family are from town, so it's kind of, it's a fairly easy thing for me to tap into. You know, just yes. my my address technically is outside outside town, but it's it's a world I feel I know very well. But like Canto in the world within the world he's involved in. That was a bit of a learning experience, but luckily I had enough resource. I know enough people that come from that background. I could tap in and ask them questions. There's one guy even like I went down to his, par- to his apartment a few times and we were even running dialogue and I was improvising with him, recording stuff. And I was like getting him to play Canto and I was really good at characters yeah. just to get ideas. But he's got, he's got, um, he's got a background that we don't really overly explain in the film. He, all, all I can say is he's had a fucking nightmare of a life coming up. And in and out of different homes, foster homes, abandoned. At one point in his childhood, he was t- he was taken abroad for a while. It's a lot of stuff me and John discuss. So he's kind of he's a mixture of different things. But yeah, town North Dublin is his home. It's kind of his kingdom where he's been residing for the past few years. Yeah. And did you feel a responsibility to get that right? Because you talk about his trauma. He sounds like such a heavy kind of character. Someone you, I think, as an actor, you can probably dig your teeth into. Yeah, big time, big time. Was there a responsibility yeah. to that? Definitely one of the best characters I've ever played. And yeah, I take I take huge responsibility with that. And I, I, I tried to tick every box I could in terms of the people I was talking to and ideas I was writing down, thinking about and staying in character. And you're second guessing yourself. As I said, like I'd be asking John questions. Should I do more of this or go more this way with it? And just kind of trusting that whatever he's suggesting to me is the right way to go with it, you know? And um, he had some mad ideas for me. Like he had little things he wanted me to keep in mind. Like, like um, Americanization or stuff, like Canto's influence by the music he listens to and stuff, you know, yeah. listens to a lot of hip hop, which I was obsessed with hip hop as a teenager. So I get that. So I had that bumping on the headphones in between scenes all the time, you know? So um, yeah, co- uh, continuous organic experience while filming, but going into it, I had tons and t- weeks and weeks of just stuff in my brain already. But yeah, man, I, I take every role I do, I take it real serious, where the character's from, their minds, how do people in that neck of the woods go on? How do they walk, talk? If John like Connors is going to come up to you with a chainsaw, you always have to keep, every time you work with him, you have to make sure they don't have one on set. Because oh, that yeah, could, just, could you improvise that and run it in. Or have me on on set as well, mate. You know I mean? <laughs> have a lightsaber battle off there. That's you'll it, definitely, yeah. You'll definitely get good to get that on film, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah oh, I'll be there with my BTS camera shooting that, yeah. <laughs> Zooming yeah. in. Yeah. Hey, we'll definitely we'll get you on the next one, man. Doing behind the scenes, man. Oh, there you go. It doesn't, doesn't sound half bad. Graham, my last couple of questions before I let you go. Man, have you ever thought about directing something? Because just I, like this wasn't even a question I was going to ask you, but the way you're talking, I mean, hmm. is that something that interests you at all, filmmaking, directing? <laughs> It does, it does interest me. And it's, I actually did direct once. I wrote and acted and directed a little short film years ago just to try my hand at doing it. It was called Comfortable Chaos. And it was just me writing about a guy going through the process of drinking hungover, arguing with the girlfriend, going back on the drink and this continuous cycle. It was just a little experiment I wanted to do. So I did it and filmed it. I didn't do it for any reason other than trying my hand at it and just seeing what it felt like to kind of be running the show. But my takeaway from it, and I still feel this way today even more, so acting in itself is such a responsibility if you're if you're doing it right it's a big job on a film set and a film set is full of all these different people doing all these really important big jobs and directing is a huge job on top of that and right now i've just got such an appetite to continually act and try these different characters and go on these different journeys if it is something i'm going to do i think it's a bit down the line but I see guys like John doing it and like my, I did another short film with a good friend of mine, Craig Moore, recently. We made another little comedy show, which John is in, actually. Mm. And uh, we only filmed that there last I week. Saw, I saw that on your Instagram. That was a Barry and the Bin Man. Barry versus the Bin Man, which is based on real experiences involving the Bin Man. And my mate Craig fictionalized that made a good little short film. Though, but but um, I watch these guys like juggling these things on set and I, I have ab- huge admiration for what they're doing. But I don't know if I could be, I'd, I'd be so wanting to play a part as well. I don't know if I'd have the capability of being like the Ben Affleck director where I want to act in it and direct it. 
You know what I mean? Because that's what that that I'd be watching all these actors in these parts go, oh, fuck, I wanna, I wanna strap up and get in there and do a bit of, you know what I mean? A bit of yeah. you know, yeah. and scene. So right now it's I don't think I'm there yet, but maybe one day, man. I mean, I got huge admiration for directors. It's a, yeah. I don't think one of my one of my favorite relationships in, involved with acting is the relationship between actor and director. When I'm on a set, I love that bouncing back and forth with the director, you know what I mean? And yeah. the little things, just, just give me enough, but not like, I don't need to be over directing all that, but just little, if I have a question, all that, and it's like, a, it, it really it really makes it enjoyable. That's when the hours are just flying by on film sets when you're getting that rapport going back and forth, you know? Yeah, oh, dude, Graham, I, th- that's fantastic. And I think if you ever do pick up directing, that's something, I mean, just the way you speak and your appreciation for film and character, I think that's something you'd really be fantastic at. But, I, mean, I actually loved your interview with, um, speaking of directors, um, what's his name, uh, Z- uh, Zeller. Um, Zeller, oh, that's yeah. my most recent one, yeah, man. Yeah, that was great, man, because I'm a, I don't know how many people have recommended Bone Tamahawk to, like, I fucking love that film. That's- and Brian Selbach on the United is great as well. But Bone Tamahawk, even Joe Paddy Slattery, who you've uh, interviewed as well, yeah. I recommended that to him a while back as well. I was like, you have to watch this Western, man. It's fucking brilliant, you know? But like that film, like how that's, how that, the direction of that film, it's so crisp and it's so fucking, yeah. it, it's, it's like a beautiful play, that film. You know what I mean? Like in, like, and then the like, spoiler alert, like gets so violent and fucking crazy. Then you know what I mean? Oh, like, is that or some legend for the violence? Yeah. I love that. And he's like, you say, you say goodbye to my wife. I'll say hello to yours. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I honestly not since the proposition, the Australian western with Guy Pearce. That I think that that uh, Bone Tomac is the best western I've seen since that, and that was made like 10, 15 years ago. The proposition, I think, you know. So you reckon westerns are dying? No, I don't think they're dying. I think they're timeless. I just don't often see new ones that blow my fucking head off. Like Assassination of Jesse James or Brad Pitt, that was one that just blew me head off. And like um, uh, what the Seraphine Falls uh, with Pierce Brosnan, that's another one that was great. Like they come along like every five or six years, a new one comes along and it just basically makes you go, yeah, I, I could happily make Westerns for the rest of my life. And I, John I've Wayne did all of them. I'd John Wayne it. John Wayne pumped out 200 of them. So what's the point anymore? He did all yeah, the good. Yeah, yeah, Clint made a whole career on it for the most part doing it as well. But um, even Tarantino's film there, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, even though it's not Western, there's so many Western elements in it with all the yeah. filmmaking. After that was over, I went back and said, like, I have to watch a few Westerns now. I just That genre is just a beautiful genre. Getting, but anyway, like, I, I was saying to John, would you ever do a Western? And John, John was so desperate to do a Western. We okay. talked about it. We talked about it, yeah. Dude, yeah. Would, you, so would you do Western? Do you have a Western in you? Oh, I'm not joking. I, I could see myself making like countless Western style films. Like you don't have to be all in the old West, but just that time period of no fucking phones, no electronics, just just your hands and just grit, tea, whiskey drinking, boom. You know, like basically a glass, getting a sip of water is basically life and death sometimes. You know, even yeah. like that would be blood. There's a real Western feel to that film. Yeah. Uh, no Country for Old Men. That's like a modern Western in my opinion. You know what I mean? Like, have, you seen, real- have you seen Hostiles by Scott Cooper? Those. with christian know. bale oh i did actually yeah where he has to transport the uh the prisoners yeah, yeah. yeah that was a great film yeah that, that's a good old western last of the mohicans is in that um yeah. the 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 bad guy in last of the mohicans i forget his name now big oh. actor he was in eat and all that i think uh back in the day what's his name again a lot of terrible names anyway yeah but, but, uh, oh, yeah that was a great film man really good Hostos is a great outfit i mean could you do an irish west i mean there's lots of irish cowboys but you'd have to shoot it in some field in Kerry oh, yeah. or yeah, yeah. yeah all has to be like just you know uh, a simpler time, you know, the olden days, early 1900s even, or something like that. And you know what I mean? Just have somebody, just raise the stakes with something, you know? Someone gets kidnapped or someone gets attacked or something, you know? So A lot of directors say they don't, they'll never, they'll, I always say, would you do a Western? They say, yeah, if there's no horses in it. Because they don't, no director likes working with horses. Because it's like, I think Robert Eggers said it's easier to work with Seagull, weirdly enough, than it is to work with. Because he did Seagulls with, in the lighthouse. And yeah. so it's it's working with animals. That's I talked with the director Ned Kelly, Gregor Jordan, and in that film he had a fucking a lion, a crocodile, a oh, horse, yeah, and yeah. all that. So, I say bring it on, man, bring it on. The yeah. harder the better, you know. And work doing's work doing right, you know. It's not supposed to be easy, but uh, no, it has to be horses. Of course, it has to be horses, now, man. It has to be horses, and a few throats getting slashed and that. You know what I mean? Like just proper gritty stuff. I just love the lack of electronics. I think nowadays, just we're surrounded with these fucking phones now all the time. Anything that takes us back to a time before that, I like. You know, and the older I get, the more into that I am. Like just and obviously, simpler. because you d- you don't know what Zoom is, it must be when you are a lad, you base the cowboy film off, Jesus you know? Christ, I'm going to put this on the record. I fucking know what Zoom is. I've used Zoom countless times. It's, I just, this computer was new, so I hadn't had it set up. 
It's all right, Graham. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it. You like you like the DVDs and the VHS. There's not. It's just it's a, it's a bygone era. Uh, what what? Are, I'll let you go after this. I swear. What what are some of your favorite films? Uh, what's your sight and sound? Because I asked John this. John gave me some great. John was fucking giving me deep cuts. I think I'm rather knowledgeable about film, but he was dropping out French films and things I've never even heard of. So what what are some of your favorite films? Uh, favorites like well I always say that like, your favorites are, are the ones you've watched the most is that fair to say your favorites yeah. in your life? so like I mean I got um I, I love those punchy kind of crime thrillers from like the late 80s all through the 90s so all the Scorsese films and that and films like State of Grace uh Carlito's Way oh yeah uh, Carlito's Way for a long time I would have called my favorite film ever you that's know? Brian De Palma isn't it yeah Brian De Palma yeah like that, that, that to me, like that, that's in, that's in that range of a film I've seen. Well, between a hundred to two hundred times, definitely. You yeah. know, and other films like that would be like Fight Club, Rage and Bull, Godfather One and Two. You know, nothing that anyone hasn't heard of, like in terms of like favorite ones. You know what I mean? But I mean, I watch everything and anything, man. You know what have I mean? you ever seen? Have you ever seen the Rage and Bull poster in Bow Street Academy? Rage and Bull. Yeah, I think I have. Yeah, years ago yeah. when I was through there. Yeah, yeah. Me and John were saying we're going to cut it off the wall and put it out in the back. It's not with the robe, is it? The one with the robe. I don't know. It's this original poster, and it's about like, it, like it's just it's the biggest poster I've ever seen, and it's up on the main wall. And every time I go in, I yeah, stare I at it. Something over like a sofa in like a hallway one time, like Rage and Bull, maybe. But maybe I'm confusing with something else. But yeah, all the imagery in Rage and Bull, man. Like that's one of those. Like Rocky One. Um, I mean, I love all the Rocky films, but Rocky one in particular is just a fucking masterpiece, and I've seen yeah. that again. Like the, all the ones I'm naming to here, these are all ones I've seen well over a hundred times. Like, and just like there was, there, there was a like, I mean, Fear and Load in Las Vegas, Big Lebowski, uh, Whitnail Night, that's a fucking great film, yeah. you know? and um. I don't know, T- tons of, I mean, like, yeah, to, like speaking of the French, like, I mean, like I named earlier on, we were talking about Black Wealth films, Bullhead and Rust and Bone. Those were two films that blew me away in re- like, not recent years, it was a few years ago now they came out. Like, those were amazing. Just this new style of recreating like that, um, that, that gangster-esque thriller sort of genre yeah. look, you know what I mean? Like very beautiful, but very gritty at the same time, you know? But I, the, there's no genre I don't like. And I mean, I'm just a film, a film fanatic, man. That's where I got into being an actor, that was just the avenue it took to me. It could have been some other area of filmmaking, but I just I just love films and I love good TV. True Detective season one, if you're naming like the oh, best. Oh man, that's the, that's pretty great season in TV going. Yeah. I call it the best season in, in television history ever. Like I love season two and three as well, but they're completely separate. Season one of that, it, like that and the Sopranos and HBO show Oz, which preceded Sopranos. Those are my three best shows ever made. And The Wire probably goes in there as well, to be honest with you. And Woody Harrelson turns around to Matthew McConaughey and says, I just want you to stop saying odd oh, shit. And he says, I don't sleep. What he, say? he says, oh, fuck. He says, I don't sleep, I dream. And Woody yeah. Harrelson just looks at him like, what the fuck? Oh, he's, uh, already, he's, he's already had enough of his shit and he's just trying to find some middle ground. He's like, did you get some sleep last night? And he's like, I don't sleep. I just dream. <laughs> like, he's just like, he's fucking, like, you know, can you ever just shut up and say something normal? You know, and that, every, every, every sentence in that, in that show, man, is just flawless. I can't say enough good things about it. Like, I, watch that, I watch that twice a year, every year, minimum. Yeah. yeah in, in the last year, what's the, what's the great, what's the great film you've seen in the last year or so? Last year, God, I don't know. Banshees. I've, Have you seen Banshees? I haven't watched year? Banshees yet. You see, I've got this long list of things I need to watch because, I've, I've kind of taken a break from watching so much stuff over the past few months. Just do less watching, just doing a little bit more reading and trying to do a bit of writing and that. So yeah. I'm watching far less than I used to. But I'm trying to think now recently, as I'm saying, the th- only things I watch, I think, are just kind of older things that I, I'd already seen years ago. I watched Training Day again there recently, a bit of Denzel. Just- oh, David Ayer. David Ayer yeah. wrote that. Anton Fuqua? I don't know how to pronounce yeah, it. Yeah, Anton Fuqua, yeah, yeah. I don't oh. think he ever touched that greatness together. I mean... Brooklyn's Finest was pretty good as well. I, I like that film a lot as well. The Training Day is magic. That, that, that belongs in a conversation with um, with the likes of Goodfellas and that. For me, for me personally, like, you know. My like, nanny so- lives in the middle of the countryside and I watch Training Day at like one in the morning in the middle of the countryside. Feels everywhere. And I, it's, it was some film, man. It was well, it, it, tra- yeah. Training yeah. Day. Tra- Every frame of it, you know, like I was like, this is this is a funny one. You ask people what their favorite films are, you know, and people generally will try and cook up like answers, like they'll name the most kind of like a uh, highly respected thing, like a Citizen Kane or something like that, which is all well and good. And I'll be like, yeah, cool, that's great. How many times have you watched Citizen Kane? They're like, ah, oh, three times. I mean, like, how many times have you watched Bad Santa? And they're like, oh, about 15 times. Yeah. Like, well, Bad Santa is your favorite film, you know? So that's how I kind of judge the best, it's just 
no matter what, what good things you can say about film, what films are you com compelled to put on again and again and again? And all the ones I named you there are just ones I've endlessly watched. I can really quote them all, you know, every line of dialogue. I think it's almost like there's a perception dilemma, I feel, in Hollywood. I mean, I've shot with a few filmmakers. It's like, like, you can tell me your favourite film is Andrei Rublev, which is a fantastic three-hour Russian film about the life of an artist. But let's, we both know you watched Indiana Jones 50 more times than that. But people don't want to, people don't want to do a sight and sound list and say Star Wars. I don't Wars. understand that. I don't understand that because any film... Any film that you want to watch, any film you even enjoy watching start to finish, that's a hell of an achievement that somebody made that. Now, if it's a film you want to watch two or three times, they've created fucking something incredible. And then if you're getting up to those bigger numbers, then it's a masterpiece. I don't care if it's Bad Santa or like another comedy, like I watch Endlessly Step Brothers. That's a fucking masterpiece. Oh, I just, I interviewed the director of that like three weeks back, Sean yeah. Andrews. Yeah, I like Film shouldn't be pretentious because films like in, in our form for people who have faced pretentiousness their whole life. So mm -hmm. it's always a bit weird to me how, you know, I mean, when people say you want, if you say something you want to be a filmmaker, they kind of scoff at you. So, you know, when you face that pretentiousness and then you go into film and then you kind of say to yourself, this is high art and this is low art. It's like, well, where's the line? Who, who says that this film is better? Like what? And I was talking to Christopher McQuarrie about this, who directed Mission Impossible, wrote Usual Suspects and stuff like that. The Academy has never sat down and said what constitutes a good film because there isn't one. Anyone can enjoy what they want. And if someone says to you, oh, my favorite film, you know what? It's not it's not a French film. My favorite film is Star Wars or my favorite film is, you know, whatever comedy film is big at that time. At least they connected with a film. At least they sat there and they honestly just loved the film and they felt something through it. It's, it's weird, man. No, yeah, for me, film is escapism. Film and TV shows and all that, it's like, that's the most important thing. Like, entertainment tends to be a word people look down on. When you're saying it's about entertainment, they go, oh, you're just talking about popcorn crap. I'm like, anything that entertains someone and gets them to forget about their life for 90 minutes, that's high value, in my opinion. I don't care what it is. So, how you make, I, like, I could be on film sets and I'd be discussing scripts with, 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 uh, with directors on sets, and i say, why don't we do this extra thing and this thing? And I'll use this argument. We're making the film more and they're kind of caught up on the meaning of the film. I'm like, that's secondary in my opinion. That's yeah. all well and good that you have a deep meaning behind it, but it has to be entertaining. Like you mentioned three billboards. That scene you're talking about there where, where he goes down, he breaks the wind and all that. That is fucking enjoyable to watch and it stirs up emotions. It makes you go, ah, oh, yeah. So you know what you're not doing? You're not thinking about your own life. You're actually yeah. enjoying the film. That's entertainment. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's the most like Rage and Bull, all the Scorsese classics. They have they they're, they're they're seen as proper cinema classics, which they are the most legendary films ever made. But they're entertaining from start to finish. Goodfellas, Taxi Driver. There isn't a frame of Taxi Driver that you're not watching Travis Bickle and you're not kind of fascinated by what De Niro's doing with his face and all that. It's yeah. entertainment. You know what I mean? Like, and I I put extreme. That's why I love Tarantino as a director and a writer. He he gets that. There's not a moment wasted in any of his films that he's not trying to entertain the audience, but he's also getting character arcs in there and storytelling them where it's going emotionally and stuff like that and paybacks later on in the script, you know? Yeah, I love Tarantino, but I think he's a fantastic filmmaker, but I don't know what, like, it's weird to me that he, he says shit like, oh, superhero films aren't cinema and stuff like that. I was like, dude, come on. I mean, let's not fool ourselves. You're not, like, I mean, Reservoir Dogs is a fantastic film, but it's not really... It's not like a, a film about grief. You know what I'm saying? It's a really fun action film, but like, it, it's weird. Like, who are we as filmmakers? Like, I, I, I just, it's always baffling me how one filmmaker can talk about another filmmaker's film and say, that's not art. It's like, well, where's the line? But yeah, I love what you're saying about connection because that's what film is about to me. Film is about connection. Yeah. And the films we enjoy most are the films we connect with. Like, my favorite film of all time is In Bruges by Martin McDonough. And yeah. I think, I was, I've, I thought this after watching Broken Law. I, I can only really see Colin Farrell playing uh, the main character. Now, I after watching Broken Law, I was like, okay, I think I, I just saw you in in that role. I think you could do. I maybe oh, maybe, that, maybe yeah. you're just a cranky bastard, and I think you do good. You oh, know, definitely, good. definitely, hundred percent. Oh man, if you if you were interviewing me, family, I tell you, I'm, I can be a miserable fucker, man. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, I am. Um, I man, I love that film as well. And I'm a big Colin Farrell fan. I've always been a huge fan. His oh, I got to, oh, he got me on the red carpet for Banshees of Inisherin. and I was doing interviews. I couldn't eat two days beforehand. I was terrified. But yeah, yeah. In Bruges is my favorite film. But I think me and Paddy Slattery actually share a favorite film. Is his favorite film Magnolia? I know he's mentioned before. Is it his favorite? I mean, that's a classic. So that like, could be yeah. his favorite. Yeah. I like In Bruges more than Magnolia, but I think Magnolia is the better, is like a betterly constructed film. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's probably technically more proficient in like what, what he does in that Paul Thomas Anderson jumping around with all the timelines and that. I know he did talk about that film when he was doing Broken Law, because Broken Law originally was a bit more 
almost intermission-y in that it was more interconnected with different. So he probably was talking about Magnolia for that reason, because that interconnects a lot of stuff in it. Yeah. But um, it, it became a little bit more simplistic and more about the brother's relationship. But that, yeah, it could be one of those favorite films. Like, I mean, like it's, Magnolia is another classic. You know what I mean? That's why it's so hard for me to name favorite films, because you can just sit here and list off 500 films, and I'll probably go, yeah, that's brilliant as well. There's so yeah. many. But that's why I never even get like, uh, like too preoccupied about watching new stuff, because I can go back and watch hundreds and hundreds of things I know are brilliant and they inspire me to rewatch them. That's why I spend so much of my time just rewatching classics that I like, you know. But um, like what you were saying there about the whole thing about the statement about Marvel films not being this or not being that. Look, man, everyone has their own interpretation of what they enjoy. Like I've, I know people, I've got family members that are obsessed with the Marvel films. I like one, one or two of them here and there, someone I'm not mad about. But like, who am I to say what they enjoy? Yeah, well, at least they're going to the cinema. Like, oh, look, I'll be on. I love super. I love. I love superheroes. But at the same time, it's like, if I, I think they're going to be all right in the cinemas. I'm going to go give my money to see After Sun or The Northman or films that need it a bit more. But like, look, if it's crazy to me to look, people are going into the cinema to see a film. That's like, that's, yeah. that's fantastic. Like you can't, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and let's be honest, you can't really, like, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say you can't beat it because there's different kinds of cinema experience you can have, but it is a hell of a cinema experience when you get a really good comic film up on the big screen in a packed audience. Like, it's a, an apps, it blasts the head off you. Like, it's a hell of an experience. So you can't deny that, you know what I mean? Like, it's enjoyable for people, you know, to go see these things with just a lot of visuals going on, you know? As Bruce Lee said, they're motion pictures, so it's a lot about motion, you know? And those yeah. films are, like, incredible with the stuff that they're doing visually. You know, I mean, I, I think some of them are like Winter Show, Winter Soldier, Captain America. I think that's a fantastic film. You know, like yeah. really, really good. Have you ever had that with film? Sorry, I, I swear I let you go after this. I was, I've talked with. Oh, so take it many- I talk with so many directors and they, they talk about 2001 Space Odyssey as being the film that made them, that changed their lives. And they described it as a religious experience. I love 2001. I watched it. I didn't feel that way, but I think I didn't feel that way because every director since 2001 A Space Odyssey has made, has tried to make 2001 yeah, A Space yeah, Odyssey. Yeah. So I, I don't think, maybe if I saw it, because this came out in the 60s, like 10 years before Star Wars or something like that, which is yeah. crazy because Star Wars was considered groundbreaking. And then, you know, he throws the club in the air and it changes to a spaceship and it's it's a beautifully made film and before that I was thinking I was like oh I don't even care for Kubrick but I was just saying that to be different and then I watched it and I was like fuck okay I think Kubrick's great uh, yeah. have you ever had that for a film where you watch because for me that was Magnolia after watching Magnolia I was like and I just felt that in my heart and it's same with Imbri- I think that's why I said film to me is about connection because the films we like most are the films we can connect with most yeah, and yeah. Magnolia the scene where frogs are falling from the sky because this is something that happens because that's life because there's no meaning to it it can look for meaning but and yeah. you know pta zooms in he changes the lens and then it says sometimes things just happen because they happen mm. and then the boy sitting there frogs are falling from the sky he goes this happens this is something that happens and what i interpreted that was that sometimes things happen and that was great because up to that point everything in the film had meaning to me everything had to mean something everything had to link to something but that was just frogs falling from the sky because why not because it united every character and that's why i think magnolia affected me so that, sorry this is so long-winded have you ever had felt that connection with film like you felt endlessly and like i mean films like it's it's like i didn't need i didn't even become an actor because I was in love with acting, literally. Like, I mean, I've grown such an appreciation for the craft that I do, and like, it's my identity now. But I got into, I got into becoming an actor because I, I'm addicted to films because they're fucking yeah. for me. For me, they're like antidepressants. Like, they pulled me out of holes in my life the way some people talk about getting prescribed a certain medication from their doctor. That's how I feel about film. Like, I mean, there's no, there's no emotional level you talk about getting to that I don't get on a regular basis. Even rewatch the films I've already seen. I'd be sitting there and like at a scene where characters are just talking about something that's not even that emotional, but because the dialogue works so way, I get emotional watching it because it's so beautifully done. And I'm getting yeah. choked up and I, I rewind it and rewatch it again. If somebody was watching the film, they'd lose their mind because I keep rewinding bits I like and rewatching them again and again, you know. So man, yeah, all the time. I mean, at the top of my head. I can't think of any in particular like examples like you had there with Magnolia, but a lot of my favorite films, I've seen them so long ago. So it's been yeah. so long since my initial time watching them. But the first time I've seen them, man, but not much on that one, man. I, I'm, I'm in love with filmmaking, man, or films in general, you know? So, I mean, some people, like, I mean, I've always liked music as well, but like the, some people, the way they talk about it, the way music touches them, it's the way films touch me. Yeah. To me, they're the ultimate art form because they incorporate music 
visuals, everything. So it's the highest form for me, you know? It's the exact same as me. And film shouldn't be, I think, made by rich people for rich people. Film has always been kind of an art form for people who just went out there with a camera and just film things. And that's that's what I think, like, there's guerrilla style filmmaking, which is one thing. But there's also going out there and telling your story in pictures, which is something that's endlessly fascinating to me and how thousands of films and yet no two films are the exact same and you could direct two two of the you could direct the same script twice and you still have two different films yeah so. yeah and just you just remind me there going back to what you were saying there um about 2001 where you would you you felt you saw it a bit late because other films had imitated it that is filmmaking like the art form like tarantino is one of the most famous examples that he openly admits he takes from like genius steals he takes from other things and he reinvents it adds his own loop on it and creates something new but it's yeah. recycled material at the end of the day film has been around now for over 100 years so every idea has kind of been done all you can do now is just do your honest interpretation of the material you know but there'll, there'll be a link to something else there'll be something that inspired you to make it i mean even as an actor I can't help but sit at certain times try and imitate guys who I idolize, you know, yeah. who, or at least I idolize the characters that they played on screen. Do you know what I mean? Like you I mean, filmmaking, that. yeah, filmmaking is just stealing things basically. But you can, that's, you that's can what it is, man. You know, remake. That's why every like every day I watch a film and I say it's just research. You know, like that's and every time you watch a film, subconsciously even there's something you take from it, and there's something yeah. you kind of. Occur. I think my love from from Wonders obviously just comes from cinema when because you know the Wonders is such kind of a violent shot, and that's why when John Connors was doing it in Black Wealth, I was like, oh man, this, yeah. like, these guys get it, so I can't wait. Graham, thank you so much, Sammy. My last and final question: What advice would you have for anyone looking to become an actor? Um, it, before before you step into it, just just make sure that it's something that you love and you yeah. want to be doing because uh, it, it's a it's a long old hard graph, but it's very rewarding. It's very rewarding when you get on those on those broken laws and black wells and cardboard gangsters. It's just fucking. I always say when I'm on film sets, there's no even on bad days, there's nowhere else I'd rather be. Even if it's a bad day on film set, everyone's a bad mood. I don't care. I was like, there's nowhere else in the world I'd rather be than on a film set, you know. Yeah. And um, and I love it, and I love the end product product of like sitting back and like watching people as I said you're watching people's reaction to what you've made and look it's going to exist long after we're all gone we're all dust all these things are still going to exist you know which is amazing yeah. and um so advice advice for actors yeah just I don't know just just perseverance I think like the most from when I start to where I am now the guys who hung in there are ones that just had that kind of relentless just you know, they just keep going no matter what. Don't let don't let that uh, sidestep you or manipulate you into fucking packing in your passion and going a different direction. Yeah. Fuck that. You know what I mean? Who cares? You know what I mean? Like, spe spend your life going after what it is you want to do. If it is definitely what you want to do, you know, that would be my advice anyway. You know, I'm not, oh. I'm not the best with it, because I'm not, I'm not the best example to take from me because uh, my life with the acting has gone this way and that way and around, upside down, that, you know. Yeah, doing some stuff. Anyway, Graham, before we finish up, are you on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, anything like that? Yeah, you can get me on Instagram. I think it's uh, Graham Early Actor, very original. Oh, uh, that on there. Yeah, if you want to give me a follow. I only just put up kind of posts about acting stuff or films I'm involved in or whatever, so. Any new projects you can promote? The Black Wealth, obviously, being the big one. Black Wealth is set to come out now on the uh, the 1st of March. If you want to come along to Lighthouse, it's on Diff there. That's going to be our initial Irish premiere. I don't know when it'll be in mainstream cinemas after that, but I'm really looking forward to that just when the general public can see it yeah. at their own convenience. Um, I just wrapped on the short film there, Barry versus the Bin Man, as I told you, Bill. And I'm, I'm, in, I'm already into developing another feature concept with Craig Moore, the director. We've made two other shorts with Three Brothers 2 and yeah. Words. I made those with Craig Moore as well. He was the right. He's amazing. He's a great director. Well, he's like him and John are my two, probably my two number one collaborators in filmmaking. The both of those guys, and they're both friends as well. So when we get together in the triangle, we just like are creating some good stuff there, you know. So just wrapped on down a new concept. But again, there's there's always stuff kind of on the horizon, but you have to wait. You have that start date to know it's definitely going to be happening. You know, yeah. like another thing as an actor, you you can't let it get you down because you prepare for things and then it gets called off. And you're like, fuck, your whole world crumbles down. I was looking forward to that. But um, just stay ready. Stay ready and be ready and stay optimistic, you know? you know? Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to chat me. Me, you and John will go get points at the horse and hound. I know you guys use that in Broken Law. Broken Let Law, me. yeah, yeah. Two, you know two minutes from yeah. my gaff. Two, I'm growing out the Ronnie so you guys can buy me a pint. 
You, it's you not can't that even close here. Yeah, I can see it coming in there, mate. Yeah. Give it a few more weeks. That's what I was showing. I just, yeah, it suddenly trapped the intro. I was like, that was just trying to show it off. But yeah, I'll let you both buy me a pint anyway because I'm that generous. Uh, I'll, Graham, I'll, shave, I'll shave off a bit of mine and you can stick it on your dash there. No problem. Oh, there you go. And then I can sell it as a souvenir once Black Gulaf comes big. And the, the Black Well, I messed it up. The Black Well. What's the Black Well? Black, the Black Gulaf. That was great. I, <laughs> I didn't say Black Gulaf. Well, at least I know how Zoom works. Graham, thank you so much for taking on. I'll talk to you a little bit off air. Next time, I'll, I'll teach you all about Zoom. Everyone, thank you guys so much for watching. Ed, the Black Wealth debuted DIFF uh, Dublin International Film Festival March 1st. Go get your tickets in the link below. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you all in the next video. As always, please make sure to like and subscribe. And if you have the means, donate to the National Death Trend Society. But keep an eye out for the Black Wealth. I'll see you all later. Bye.